Morning, First Baptist family. Well, today we continue our study in the book of First Samuel, chapter 3. A very famous story, the call of Samuel in the middle of the night. Four times God calls him, but it's not just about the calling today. In fact, we're going to see an eerie parallel. The lights went out in the temple, and we're going to ask, have the lights gone out in the church today? Join me in the worship center. First Baptist, we're glad that you're here. And as we lift our hands, the heavens open, heavens open. So let our lives declare the love our God has spoken. Heaven's open, heaven's open, so let our lives 
Good morning, First Baptist. If you'll be seated for just a moment today, I want to welcome you not only to First Baptist, but I want to welcome you to the celebration of the ordinance of baptism. Today, we have the privilege of two young people declaring publicly their personal faith in Jesus Christ. So I'm going to turn over to my good friend who's twice my size but made out of the same cloth, Brother Paul. You know, he gives me a great compliment, and in my mind, I'm thinking this is the only time in his life he's taller than me. Uh, so I'm not going to say what I was thinking in my head. Uh, oh, this is how it happens. They put me on the spot with the mic. But this is my buddy Carter. And a couple years ago, he asked Jesus Christ to be his Savior, understood that he's a sinner. And a few weeks ago, his parents called and said he was ready to be baptized. And so he came into the office, and we talked about what baptism is and how it represents an outward expression of inward change and how it's his way to boldly tell you, church, that he's a follower of Christ. And so I'm excited, as you should be. And I know there's some of you in here. I'm, I'm always all, often going to give you this challenge of you, you may be sitting there thinking, I need to be bold in my faith, and I need to proclaim who I follow. And so if you are waiting to take that step in baptism, let Carter, let Walker be an example and a motivation for you. But Carter, I told you, I was going to ask you one question. Has there been a time in your life when you've asked Jesus Christ to save you from your sins? Yes. All right. Cross your arms. Carter, as my brother in Christ, it gives me great pleasure to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried in the likeness of his death, raised to walk in newness of life. dad's filming he wants to see you so stand right he's right there you can say hi dad this is walker this summer walker made that same decision to follow jesus christ as his savior and he, he was really excited he's he's not wearing my shirt we uh we just didn't have any youth sizes over here today uh, but walker is a sweet boy with a sweet spirit and when i asked him right before this i said are you nervous he's just had this stone look on his face he goes i don't ever get nervous and I said, you're scaring me right now, Walker. Uh, but Walker, I told you I was going to ask you a question. Has there been a time in your life when you've asked Jesus Christ to save you from your sins? Yes. All right, buddy. Have a seat right here. Cross your arms for him. Walker, as my brother in Christ, it gives me great pleasure to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried in the likeness of his death. Raised to walk in newness of life. Oh, he's over here. Back to you, Doc. You know, it just, I can speak on my behalf and hopefully for yours, it just never gets old. You know, for 2,000 years, we've been taking believers of all ages and all stages and going through what we know as baptism. And as Paul so wonderfully explained. It's a picture on the outside of that which has happened on the inside. And really, that's the challenge for all of us today. As we sing these songs together, as we're challenged by the Word of God, is to allow the Lord to transform us on the inside, and then eventually it will be displayed on the outside. For those of you that have gathered on our campus today, number one, we welcome you. We're grateful. I just want to let you know at the end of the service, we do have a guest reception. You will not be the first uh, to attend. We had multiple families that were back there the first hour. We do have a token of gratitude, just a little gift we'd like to give you just as a thank you for being here. But more importantly, we just love to hear your story. Uh, whether you're new to our community, whether you've been here for a long season of life and it's your first time with us, whatever the story, we would just love the privilege of meeting you face to face. And for those of you watching online or listening on the radio, again, what an honor. Uh, that of all the, the things you could be doing, all the places that you're here with us, worshiping alongside of us. And that's a critical designation. I want to be clear about something. You're not watching us or listening to us worship. You are participating with us. And so thank you again for being a part of the First Baptist family today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we continue our time of worship, God, what a, what a wonderful celebration today that you're still in the saving business. You're still in the forgiving business. You're still in the raising us up out of death business. And God, today we give thanks, just like we've sung, not just for all you have done, but the fact that you are still saving and forgiving. And so God, as we continue to worship, as we allow our hearts to be shaped and prepared 
for the hearing of your word. I got to pray that all the voices that just constantly come at us would just be supernaturally drowned out. And that today in this place, you would be the audience of one. It is in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Let's stand. Cause I know you make a way And I don't always understand I don't always get to see But I will believe it I will believe it You make mountains move You make giants fall You use songs of praise To shake prison walls I will speak to my fear I will preach to my doubt You were faithful then You'll be faithful now We're standing on you Standing on your word Calling heaven down to earth You will fight my enemies This will end in victory I will believe it Yes, I will believe it You make mountains move You make giants fall Songs of praise to shake prison walls. I will speak to my fear. I will preach to my doubt. You will faithful in. You will be faithful now. You will faithful in. You will be faithful now. And I know that I know you never fail. Yes, I know that I know you never will. Yes, I know that I know you never fail. Yes, I know that I know you never will. Cause you make mountains move. To my doubt, you were faithful there. You will be faithful now. You make mountains move. You make giants fall. You use songs of praise to shake prison walls. I will speak to my fear. I will preach to my doubt. You will be faithful in. You will be faithful now. You will be faithful in. You will be faithful now. Come on, let's thank Him for His faithfulness. Yeah. You're the God of covenants and faithful promises. Oh, time and time again, you have proven you'll do just what you say. Though the storms may come and the winds may blow, I remain stand fast. And let my heart learn when you speak a word, it will come. 
to pass. Great is your faithfulness to me. Great is your faithfulness to me. From the rising sun to the setting sun, I will praise your name. Great is your faithfulness to me. Yes. Freedom in this place. Thank you, Jesus. God from age to age, though the earth may pass away. Your word remains the same, oh, your history can prove there's nothing you can do, you're faithful and true. Though the storms may come and the winds may blow, I remain steadfast. And let my heart learn when you speak a word, it will come to pass. Come on. Praise your faithfulness to me. Great is your faithfulness to me. From the rising sun to the setting sun, I will praise your name. Great is your faithfulness. Thank you.
him for that faithfulness. I want to read a verse to you. It's out of Jeremiah, and it's a simple verse. Chapter 10, verse 6, and it says this. There is none like you, O Lord. You are great, and great is your name in might. Let me read it one more time. There is none like you, O Lord, for you are great, and great is your name in might. This morning as we gather in this place, we serve a God who is mighty and who's powerful. And can I tell you that this is a safe place to worship? Guys, you, you may choose for your hands to be down by your side and worship, that's okay. You may lift your hands, that's okay. Some of us clap, some of us don't, it, it doesn't matter. Listen. We're here to connect with the Spirit of God. And so in whatever form or fashion you feel like that connection needs to happen, all I ask is that you honor the Lord. Because worship is not about you, and it's not about me. When we use the word worship, we are establishing worth upon something. And in this case, we establish worth upon the name of Jesus Christ because he is the only one who is truly worthy. God, we love you, and in this place, we lift high the name of Jesus. There's no name that we lift up except for you. So all we want, God, is to meet with you and to experience you. Have your way in this place. Do what you will. Father, we want to feel you. We want to experience you. We want to know that you're here. Have your way, Father. We understand and acknowledge you and your greatness. Thank you, Jesus.
with shout of acclamation and lead me home what joy shall fill my heart then I shall bow in humble adoration and then proclaim my God how great Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, when we think of all the words and adjectives and phrases we could use to describe who you are, God, we, we could use them for all of eternity and never run out of them. But God, today we very simply and declaratively state that you are great. God, today as we approach your word, Lord, help us to understand that it is out of your greatness that you give us these words. It is out of your greatness that you give us these warnings. And it is out of your greatness that, God, today you display your mercy and your grace. Today we declare that thou art great. And, God, today may we not just declare it in song, but may we live it out by the hearing and the doing of your word. It is in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. This morning, I want to encourage you, open your Bibles in the Old Testament to the book of 1 Samuel chapter 3. Now, you may be your guest or visitor with us this morning. If you are, I want to welcome you to a journey uh, through a book of the Bible, the book of 1 Samuel, that has a lot of characters and a lot of scenes that we're pretty familiar with. I mean, after all, this is the book of the Bible that brings that classic battle of David and Goliath. Uh, this is the book of the Bible at the very end who has this really mysterious story of the witch of Endor. But more than just those specific stories and characters, one of the things that we see in the book of 1 Samuel is this. We see a people, we see a community, for lack of better terms, we see a culture that is drifting from the sacred to the secular. 
We see a people who for years have been governed by the judges that God put in place. But it is here in the book of 1 Samuel where they say, we don't want to be ruled by God's means. We don't want to do it according to his way. We would rather be like just everybody else. And today as we come to chapter 3, we're going to discover that that community, that culture, is in an eerily similar situation that you and I are in our world today. And here's the thing I want you to grasp. That the situation that they're in, the same situation we're in, it has the same solution, even if we're 3,000 years removed. In 1 Samuel chapter 3, beginning verse 1, it says that the child of Samuel, he ministered unto the Lord before Eli. The word of the Lord was precious in those days. There was no open vision. And it came to pass at that time when Eli was laid down in his place, his eyes began to wax dim. He could not see. And ere the lamp of God went out in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was, and Samuel was laid down to sleep. Then the Lord called Samuel, and he answered, Here am I. And he ran to Eli, and he said, Here I am. You called me. He said, I did not call you. Lie down again. And he went and he laid down. Verse 6, And the Lord called yet again, Samuel. Samuel rose, and he went to Eli, and he said, Here I am, for you have called me. And he answered, I did not call you, my son. Go lie down again. Now Samuel did not know yet the Lord, neither was the word of the Lord yet revealed in him. The Lord called Samuel again the third time. He arose, he went to Eli and said, here I am, for you have called me. And Eli perceived that the Lord had called the child. Therefore Eli said unto Samuel, go lie down and it shall be. If he call you again, say, speak, Lord, for thy servant hears. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. The Lord came, stood and called as other times, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel answered, speak, for thy servant heareth. And the Lord said unto Samuel, Behold, I will do a thing in Israel, in which both the ears of everyone that heareth it shall tingle. In that day I will perform against Eli all the things that I have spoken concerning his house. When I begin, I will also make an end. For I have told him I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knoweth, because his sons made themselves vile, and he restrained them not. Therefore, I have sworn unto the house of Eli that the iniquity of his house shall now be purged with sacrifice or with offering forever. Samuel lay into the morning. He opened the doors of the house of the Lord. Samuel feared to show Eli the vision. Then Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son. He answered, here am I. He said, what is the thing that the Lord has said unto you? I pray thee, hide it not from me. God, do so to thee and more also if you hide anything from me, the things that he said unto you. Verse 18, and Samuel told him everything. He hid nothing from him. He said, it is the Lord. Let him do what seemeth him good. And Samuel grew and the Lord was with him. He did let none of the words fall to the ground. And all of Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, knew that Samuel was established to be a prophet of the Lord. Listen to verse 21. And the Lord appeared again in Shiloh. For the Lord revealed himself to Samuel in Shiloh by the word of the Lord. Even in the midst of a culture drifting from the secular to sacred, even in the midst of a people, as we're going to see today, who are so contrary to the things of God and the Word of God, what do we discover? That God is still faithful to those who desire Him. God is still faithful to those who are willing, as Samuel did, to quote, answer the call. So, what was the situation that they found themselves in? The same situation we find ourselves in today, and ultimately, what? Is a solution. Well, verse one, it's pretty precarious, is it not? It says that the word of God was not there. There was no open vision. It was precious in those days. In other words, God had stopped speaking. Now, here's what's interesting about this story. You and I today, we experience this on a trite level every single day because you and I are addicted to these cell phones. I mean, we have them, right? It's just part of our life. And yet you know and I know on a regular basis, sometimes on a daily basis, there comes a point where you're on a conversation with somebody and all of a sudden you can't hear them anymore. What's the first thing you say? Can you hear me now? Isn't that interesting? That as soon as we get that silence on a cell phone call, we immediately say, I can't hear you. We've got a broken connection. Do you see that in verse 1? There's no interest into hearing the voice of God. And yet, here's what we do in our world today. It's amazing to me. You look at all the science behind it, all these satellites that are going around, all the technology. So what do we do? If all of a sudden that phone call has some type of disconnection, we think 
Now, hopefully you'll laugh with me here. We think that by taking that phone and raising it 18 inches up in the air, somehow this is going to work, right? Or maybe if we just walk around the corner. Or maybe if we just stop, whatever it may be. But here's the point. When we notice that there's an absence of communication, we immediately address it. And they didn't. The word of God was precious. There was no open vision. It's much like the book of Amos. And even though the Lord would give that to his people years later in Amos chapter 8, he says there's a famine that is coming. And not a famine for meat or drink, but a famine for the word of God. And you and I, at least in our culture today, we're not living out Ray Bradbury's Fahrenheit 451, that dystopian picture of all literature in the Bible being gone. In fact, did you know the average American home, the average American home has three Bibles inside of it? And so the famine that we have, as we're going to address in a moment, is not access to it, but accessing it in our lives. But in verse 2, I want you to see a picture. Eli at the end of the day, and and by the way, it's going to describe him physically, but I want to take that more to a spiritual picture. It says, and it came to pass at that time when Eli was laid down in his place, his eyes began to wax dim. Now, again, I don't want to speak to him physically because we all understand that with age, your eyes just grow dim. In fact, I'll, I'll never forget the first time I went to an optometrist and got diagnosed that I needed reading glasses. Young guy, about half my age, very educated, very proficient. He pushed back away uh, from the little, you know, exam area. And he says, Dr. Myers, he said, would you like your prognosis? I said, what's wrong with me? He said, you're old. I said, what? And he goes, this is very normal for guys about your age that it just, it goes by the wayside. And just this last week, I had to get my prescription updated. That's right. I'm waiting one more week. I get the lenses. I'm going to be able to see all y'all out there. It's going to be a great day. We understand that physically. It's just a part of life. But there's more there. See, the word of the Lord was not present. There was no open vision, and Eli could not see what was happening. Now think about it. He should have. In chapter 1, when Hannah was pouring her soul out, he couldn't see her genuine spirit. In chapter 2, when his sons were being so devious with the sacrifice, he could not see it. In just a moment, he's about to, he can't even see that the lamp has gone out in the house of the Lord. Why is that important? Because in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, it says, talks about the gospel being hid to those that are lost. He said, because the God of this world has blinded their eyes. Why could he not see it? Not just because he physically had dim vision, but spiritually, there was no word of the Lord. There was no communication with the Lord. And that is exactly what Satan uses in our life. If you want to get your world sidetracked, in fact, sometimes I've heard people doing this in their Bibles. They'll put a kind of a little phrase at the beginning. This book will keep me from sin, but sin will keep me from this book. We'll address that in just a moment. But it's not just on a personal, it's a corporate level. Romans chapter 11, it says that Israel, the people of God, are now in part blind until the time of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Have you ever had just one of those moments where you're in a conversation with somebody or maybe you're, you're seeing it what's happening around and saying, I don't understand. Why, why can't people see what's really happening? Why can't they see it? Because Satan has blinded them. How could Eli miss Hannah? How could Eli miss his sons? How could he miss us? Because he was spiritually blinded. I want you to see the product. It's found there in verse three. It says, an heir, the lamp of God went out in the temple. Now, this verse is more significant than you may ever realize. Back in Exodus chapter 25, uh, when that famous tabernacle was first instructed to be built, uh, the Lord came with a lot of specifics. He talked about the colors of the fabric, the the weave, and, and all the different things. It was supposed to be a certain dimension by this and that. By the time you get to chapter 27, the Lord institutes a lamp. And he says there in verse 20, the lamp is never to go out whether it be night or day, whether people are sacrificing actively or not, it is never to go out. You find it interesting that when the people of God don't have the voice of God and the men who are supposed to speak on behalf of God can't see God, what happens? The light goes out. That's exactly what happened here. In fact, Jesus speaking in what we know as the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, 
He said that you are the light of the world and you're designed to be like a city built on a hill and no man takes a bowl and comes and covers it, but he lets it shine. And this situation is not just theirs, it's ours. When the word of God is not active in our life and we hear the world more than we hear the word, guess what happens? The light goes out. The impact goes out. The difference goes out. And much like 1 Samuel chapter 3, I hate to share this with you, but what we know is this umbrella of Christendom, I think we could say in some respects the light has gone out. But here's the good news. Just because the light went out did not mean that God was done. In fact, in verse 4, what happens? He calls Samuel. He calls him. And even though there's this interesting process of him going to Eli and back and forth, verse 21 is, quote, coming. So what's the solution? Whether it be in 1 Samuel 3, whether it be in our lives today, what is God's solution when the word of God is not recognized, when the voice of God is not heard, and when the lamp, quote, goes out? He always provides. He always has provision. But here's the issue. When did it happen? When does God come into our life and show us what needs to be corrected. When does God come and say, I need this to be addressed? Can I just go ahead and confess? It's at the most inopportune moments. I mean, think about this story. When did he come visit Samuel? In the middle of the night. I mean, he came at a time where we think, at least on our calendar, this is when rest and and this is when recuperation is, is gonna take place. It just seems that the biblical record is that God always comes at times where we had other things planned to do. I mean, think about who we know as Saul of Tarsus. I mean, here was a man with a great education, great pedigree, making his way to Damascus, just going about his job, and then God shows up right there, right? Completely inconvenient time. And one of the issues that we're going to discover today is one of the reasons that the lamp goes out, quote, in our lives is because we're not willing to let God speak at the inconvenient moments in our life. But how did he do it? Notice what he said. Samuel, he spoke. Now, I don't want to be overly simplistic this morning, but when God is desiring to move in your life, and when he's desiring to move in my life, and when he's desiring to move in our community's life, guess how he does it? He speaks. That's what he does. In fact, you go back to the Garden of Eden. How did humanity know what to and not do, God told them? He said, of every tree of the garden you can eat except that one. Things go sideways. In fact, all of humanity by Genesis 6 is all in an uproar. And he went and he found a man by the name of Noah. You know what he did? He did not drop blueprints from heaven. He spoke to Noah on what to do. Humanity goes sideways again. We build the Tower of Babel and we basically thumb our nose at God. There's a man by Abraham, Ur the Chaldees. How did God do? He called him. He spoke to him. Do you see the pattern? Every time we see a situation like 1 Samuel 3 where the quote lamp is out, God speaks. And when God speaks, there is power. Now, when we use the word power in a biblical sense, basically the modern day word is dynamite for that word. It means to remove an obstruction that cannot otherwise be removed. It means to put a blockade there that nothing can pass through. And so how is it that God's solution of provision is powerful? Who did he call? I know it's Samuel technically, but a man. He spoke to an individual. Remember the faithfulness of God in the individual in spite of the environment? He speaks to him. He says, I have called you out. Now, some of you may have heard this adage before, but all throughout the scripture and all throughout time, when God desires to move, he always starts with a person. He always starts with a man. He calls us out. And when he calls us out, he then starts a movement. And God begins to move. But lest we pay attention, there can come a time where we're so interested in just continuing the activity of whatever we call the movement of God that we become a machine. We just, quote, keep the doors open and keep the lights on. And you know what happens over time to that machine? It becomes a monument. We stick a sign up that says, God used to move there. You know what had happened in 1 Samuel 3? There was about to be a sign put up. God was about to say it used to be in Shiloh. Look in verse 21. What does he say? And God appeared again where? In Shiloh. They were about to put the monument up. The light had been turned out. There was no open vision. But God did what God always does. In power, he came to a man. And he said, Samuel, I'm calling you. So what did he do? 
According to verse 21, it says, the Lord appeared again in Shiloh. For the Lord revealed himself to Samuel and Shiloh. Listen to this last statement. By the word of the Lord. Now, why is that so critical? Because God, when he speaks in our vernacular today, he always does so in conjunction with his word. And if I've heard what I'm about to share with you once, I've heard it hundreds of times. I don't mean anything ill. It's just a part of who we are as humanity. How many times have you been walking through a situation or you're bothered by something and you make this statement, maybe verbally, maybe non-verbally, God, I just wish you would speak. God, I just wish that the heavens would open. I just wish I could hear your voice. We've all been there, right? Can I give you the illustration that I have in my mind when we say those things? Notice I didn't say when you, but when we say those things. I get this picture, I get this image of a person just bearing their soul to God. Uh, maybe on their knees, uh, they're on their bed. I mean, the tears are dropping. I, I mean, they're just in despair going, God, I just need you to speak. And all along, there's a Bible on the nightstand three feet away. People say, you know, I just wish God would speak. He has. I've heard people say, I just wish God would speak out loud. Then read the Bible out loud. He has spoken to us. The problem is, kind of like Eli, he was looking for answers in other places and other means, but what is God's pattern? His solution is always the same. When we find ourselves in this situation, he always provides. There's always a Goshen in the midst of Egypt. There's always a remnant in the midst of a rebellious people. And how does he do it? He calls us out according to his word. But there's a problem. You say, what do you mean there's a problem? I want you to notice where this story takes place. You say, what do you mean where it takes place? It's in the temple. It's where they hung out. This was just a part of their life. Yeah, that's the problem. You say, why is that a problem? I'm going to ask a question today, and this is going to be a dangerous question to ask, okay? But I'm going to ask it anyway. How many of us spend more time wishing and hoping that the White House would get right instead of the house of God? You say, well, why is this a problem? Because when God speaks, he always starts at his house. Now, eventually, it'll get out there. Don't worry. It'll get there eventually. But that's one of the problems. We think that, quote, what we need fixed in this world is up there in D.C. It's not in D.C. It's right here. It's not up in those houses, for a lack of better terms. It's in his house. 1 Peter 4, 17 says, judgment must begin at the house of God. And so we spend so much time viewing, reading, and articulating the issues and the concerns of this world and pleading, God, please show up while our Bibles lay closed on the nightstand three feet away. Do you get the problem now? You say, why? Why is this so important? Look in verse 21. And the Lord appeared again. See, the light had gone out. There was no open vision, but God showed up again. I almost have in my mind uh, this, this crew has shown up to stick the sign up. That in Shiloh, God used to move. In Shiloh, God used, you may not realize this, and I'll make it brief. You and I, in this context, in this culture, whether you're aware of it or not, over hundreds of years, we've had the privilege of seeing God do some incredible movements some in revivals, awakenings, whatever word you want to give it. I got news for you. He can do it again. You say, man, I've pleaded, I've begged. You know how he does it again? Exactly how he did here in 1 Samuel 3. When the people of God listen and do the word of God. One final thought. God comes to Samuel. He tells him what he needs to do. Remember what Samuel did? He said he feared it because he was going to have to speak truth. And he was going to have to live truth. And he was going to have to call it out for what it was and what it is. Here's the neat thing. The light came back on. The sacrifices, as we go through 1 Samuel, were restored in their proper capacity. Because one person heeded the word of God and was faithful to the word of God in the midst of a faithless generation and a faithless culture. May we realize today... We're in the same situation, but God has not changed his solution.
Let's pray with our heads bowed, our eyes closed. Today as we come to this time of our service, an opportunity uh, to respond. You know, maybe you're that individual today who, for whatever reason, this was that moment, this was that day where the Spirit of God took the Word of God and it just resonated. It just spoke unto your soul and you realized that you've just been wandering, proverbially in the darkness, and not to overuse the word, just lost. And maybe today the light bulb came on. Maybe today the word of God came alive and you realized that you're a lot like Samuel. God is speaking to you. God is calling you. And you need to respond. You know, the Bible says whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Not whoever takes a course and passes a test. Not whoever is found proficient in this versus that. It just says if you call on the name of the Lord. You see this pictured so well here in chapter 3. Samuel just said, I'm here, God, I'm here. Maybe today's that day in your life. It's not about the specific words that you say. It's about your heart cry to the Lord. Maybe today you're that person who needs to cry out, as Romans 10, 13 says, to be saved. If you are, let me encourage you. Maybe your heart's cry would go a little something like this. God, today I realize I've been wandering in darkness. I've been walking in darkness. God, I'm lost. God, I got a sin problem. God, I'm just willing to admit it. I've been places I should have never been. God, I've said things I should have never said. And God, you know I've had things and thoughts between my ears that only you are aware of. And according to your word, the wages of the result of my sin is death. But you also said, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So God, today I believe that you are the one who can turn on the light in my life. You are the one that can bring life out of death. So God, I want you to know I believe. God, today I believe that Jesus Christ loved me so much that he was willing to come on my behalf. He was willing to live a sinless life on my behalf. God, I believe that when he allowed himself to be hung on the cross, as he bled there before all of humanity, he was bearing the punishment and the price of my sin. And God, I believe that three days later when he rose from the grave, he made it possible, he made it feasible for my sin to be forgiven and my soul to be saved. God, today, I don't have all the answers to all the problems of life, but there's one thing I know. Jesus Christ is the only answer to my sin problem. The best way I know how, I'm asking you to forgive me. I'm asking you to save me. I just want to turn my life over to you. With our heads still bowed, our eyes still closed, maybe you're that person today who needs to step out and step forward. Or maybe that person today say, you know what? I'm already a believer, but like these young people that came before, I need to fall in believer's baptism. Or maybe you're that person today, like we had in the first service, said, I got all that covered, uh, but I need to be a part of this incredible body of believers. Or maybe today, it's not about stepping out and stepping forward. Maybe today is about stepping out of this place in a few moments with a completely different perspective on how God desires to solve the issues, not just of your life, but of our entire cultures. Lord Jesus, as we come to this time of decision, thank you. God, thank you that you haven't put up the monument sign yet. God, thank you that you haven't closed and locked the door. God, thank you that much like with Samuel in 1 Samuel, that you've given us a chance, a chance to heed your word, a chance to respond to your word, and a chance to live your word. Oh God, today, may we listen to your voice and your voice alone. It is in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. If you would stand with me as our team leads us, whatever decision, we'll be right here at the front. I will believe it. I will believe it. You make mountains move. You make giants fall. You use songs of praise to shake prison walls. I will speak to my fear. You preach to my doubt, you were faithful then, you'll be faithful now, and you make mountains move, you make giants fall, you use songs of praise to shake prison walls, I will speak to my fear, I will preach to my doubt, you were faithful.
as we continue our opportunity to respond, uh, just know that maybe today you need to be prayed with, prayed for. Maybe there's a decision uh, weighing heavy upon your heart. That opportunity is still here. We're still down here uh, toward the front. But in a moment, we all have the opportunity uh, to respond with the giving of our tithes and our offerings. And if you're seated on the very far right-hand side of your respective section, you'll notice uh, that there's a basket underneath in just a moment. Uh, we're going to have a time of prayer. And when the amen is said and we are seated, uh, if you would take that basket and just pass it down uh, the aisle, we'd be much appreciative. I'm going to ask my good friend and yours, uh, John Bowles, to come and pray for us. As he comes and prays for us, may our hearts be prepared to give. John, you pray. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, um, for your word for this uh, great example of how you called Samuel. Um, help us to be reminded of that That's the same way you've called us. Um, you've come after us, even when we didn't deserve it. Um, let us acknowledge that and be thankful. Lord, thank you for your word that guides us and reveals who you are to us. Um, as we give these tithes and offerings, I pray that you give us wisdom as a church spend that money in a way that would bring glory and honor to you. In Christ's name I pray, amen. I am standing on your word Calling heaven down to earth You will fight my enemies This will end in victory I will believe it Yes, I will believe it. You make mountains move. You make giants fall. You use songs of praise to shake prison walls. I will speak to my fear. I will preach to my doubt. You are faithful then. You will be faithful. As this service begins to draw to a close, in just a moment, Dan Strickland, uh, who's our next generation pastor, is going to come after video announcements. He's going to share with you about that guest reception I spoke about earlier. And, and maybe you're one of those individuals. Say, you know what? I, I know we had this response time, but I, I really, I, I need some time with some. I need to be prayed with, prayed for. He's going to share with you. We've got a whole team set aside. We've got a room set aside. We don't want you to think that that time to respond has drawn to a close. In fact, we have the rest of the morning. We'd love uh, to facilitate that in your lives. As always, what you're about to see is just a highlight of some of the ministry opportunities. Uh, we'd encourage you, whether it be through social media or our website, to see all that is happening. But here are a few timely highlights of some ministry opportunities in the life of First Baptist. Watch this quick video. Welcome to First Baptist. My name is Megan and thanks so much for joining us today. Do you have a first grader? First grade Bible presentation is on Sunday, September 11th. We want to encourage you to sign up your current first grader to be a part of this major milestone. You may sign up at fbcokids.com. 7th and 12th grade students, life groups begin September 11th. We would love for you to be a part of these weekly discipleship groups on Sunday nights. Registration closes August 31st. Details and registration are at fbcostudents.com. The student worship team for grades 7 through 12th will begin on Sunday, September 11th at 5 p.m. in the choir room. Women, Dine by Design is Thursday, September 15th at 6 in the evening in the 316 Center. Tickets are now on sale for $30 at fbcofalika.com slash women. There will be dinner, speaker, and the tables will be decorated by women from FBCO. Men, Man Church is Thursday, September 22nd. Guest speaker Annie Blanks will be joining us in the 316 Center. Worship will be led by our contemporary worship team. This event is free, but there will be limited meal tickets available for Hibachi on Wheels. Meal tickets for college age and younger are $10. Regular meal tickets are $15. Purchase meal tickets at fbcofalika.com slash men. We are so excited to announce that the Voices of Lee are back at FBCO Sunday, September 25th. They will lead worship in all morning and evening services. All services will be held in the worship center. Women, Christian comedian Shonda Pierce is here Thursday, November 10th. Get your tickets now at fbcofalika.com slash women. Make sure to stay connected with us throughout the week. Go to our website at fbcofalika.com and on all social platforms. 
Join us tonight in the worship center at 6 p.m. for evening service. Have a great afternoon. Thank you for being here with us this morning. Uh, it's a great day to be together in the house of the Lord. Um, we're thankful uh, that you're here. Um, as Pastor Jeff mentioned, we do have um, a time following the service. If you're visiting with us today and you'd like more information um, about our church or a chance to meet Pastor Jeff, um, we'll have that time available. Or for anyone in the room, if there's um, a prayer request that you have or a conversation that you'd like to have, we've got a team set aside um, that would love to do that, that would be glad to take that time with you, to pray with you, to talk through um, whatever you're going through. So um, they'll be available as you make your way out the doors. Um, our hospitality team will be available, um, and they'll help you connect there. Also, um, if you are interested in uh, jumping into a Bible study at 11 o'clock, we've got some great Sunday school options at 11 o'clock, and so um, we'll have, you can find one of those, those uh, hospitality team members as well, and uh, they'll help you find uh, the place to go for that. As we close out this morning, I'll close us on a word of prayer, and then we'll dismiss together this morning. God, you are good, and we thank you for um, what a privilege it is to gather in your house this morning to lift high and exalt the name of Jesus. Lord, thank you for your incredible love for us that was displayed on the cross. Um, God, may we never lose sight of that. May we never um, take that for granted, uh, Lord, what you have done for us. Lord, as we go from this place, would you send us out um, with that in our mind that you have done everything you had to do so that we could in turn um, honor and glorify you with our lives. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Y'all have a great Sunday.